Section 7.6, Improper Integrals. Let's consider the integral 0 to b e to the minus x dx, which we know would be minus e to the minus x evaluated from 0 to b, which would be minus e to the minus b plus e to the 0, so it would be 1 minus e to the minus b. We know the limit as b goes to infinity of e to the minus b is of course the same thing as limit b goes to infinity 1 over e to the b, which we know is 0. Therefore, we could say the limit as b goes to infinity of the integral 0 to b e to the minus x dx is simply the limit as b goes to infinity of 1 minus e to the minus b, which would be 1. And in that sense, we're going to make the definition that the integral from 0 to infinity e to the minus x dx is 1 in the following sense. Given any small number epsilon greater than 0, we now know that there is some large n value such that if b is greater than that n value, the integral from 0 to b e to the minus x dx minus 1 is less than epsilon, meaning we can make the value of this definite integral from 0 to b as close to 1 as we like by simply making this upper limit value sufficiently large, which is what this limit tells us. And in that sense, we can now give meaning to the definition of an integral in which one of the limits is infinite. And so really, when I say definition on this line above, what we want to say is that the integral from a to infinity of a function is equal to the limit as, let's say, b goes to infinity of the integral a to b f of x dx if, and that's a big if, this limit exists. Note that for this to make sense, f of x must be continuous on its interval of integration, which in this case would be a to infinity. So if a function is continuous on the interval a to infinity closed at a, and the limit of this integral, the one where I have replaced the upper limit, which was an infinity, by some letter, say b, and I'm now taking the limit as b goes to infinity of that definite integral. If that limit exists, then that is the value that we're going to assign to this integral. And we're going to call the integral a to infinity f of x dx an improper integral. Uh, improper in the sense that the interval of integration is not a finite closed interval. There are two types of improper integrals, as we'll see shortly. Type 1, if you want to call them type 1 and type 2, is where the interval of integration is infinite, which is the type we're talking about right now. We can also have an integral of this form negative infinity to a f of x dx, which again, of course, would be an infinite interval of integration, this time going from a finite value on the right to negative infinity. So for this to make sense, number one, we would have to have our function be continuous on the interval of integration, which in this case would be that interval. 
and we would define the value of this improper integral to be the limit as b goes to negative infinity of the integral b to a f of x dx, of course, provided this limit exists. Okay, if these limits we're talking about exist, then we say that the improper integral converges, which means when we take the limit, we'll get a value. If these limits in either of these two cases don't exist, we say the improper integral diverges. So those are the two key words. Convergent or a convergent improper integral is an integral we've defined in the ways that we talked about above where we take the limit and we actually get a value. If we take that limit and we get infinity or we simply get a does not exist limit evaluation, we'll say that the improper integral is divergent. Okay, let's look at a couple of simple examples. So first let's consider the integral negative infinity to 2 1 over over 4 minus x squared dx. Okay, again the interval of integration is negative infinity to 2 I can see that that function is continuous on that interval. That is the function 1 over 4 minus x squared is continuous on this interval. So I can evaluate this improper integral by simply replacing the thing that's causing this to be improper, which is that negative infinity. I'm going to do it by replacing the negative infinity with a variable, a letter, and then taking the limit as b approaches now make sure if it's a negative infinity that you're taking the limit as b approaches negative infinity. Okay, now what do I do? I simply evaluate the integral. Now of course this is just limit b approaches negative infinity integral b to 2 4 minus x to the negative 2 dx. I recognize that that's a u to the negative 2 du form if I have a negative right here so that the negative dx makes the du. That means I'd have to compensate with a negative out there. In which case I have the limit as b goes to negative infinity of negative, which is that negative right there, and then the integral of u to the minus 2 du, which we know is negative u to the minus 1, which would make this negative a plus again. And I would have u to the minus 1, which is 1 over 4 minus x, evaluated from b to 2, which means I'm going to take the limit as b approaches negative infinity of, now we simply evaluate this antiderivative the way we would with any other definite integral. I plug in 2 and I get 1 half. I plug in b and I get minus 1 over 4 minus b. What's the limit as b approaches negative infinity of 1 over 4 minus b? Well as b gets large in magnitude I know the limit of this quantity will be 0. That means the limit of this entire antiderivative is 1 half. Therefore, I'll say that the integral negative infinity to 2, 1 over 4 minus x squared dx is equal to 1 half. And again, I know it's equal to in the limit sense, but I will definitely call this a convergent improper integral with a value of 1 half. Let's look at another similar example. 
Uh, let's try one that goes to positive infinity this time. Let's try integral 0 to infinity x e to the minus x. Now, we haven't really mentioned this yet, but if we think about how the area under a curve when you're going over an interval that starts at a and goes forever to the right, how is it possible that when I evaluate the integral of a positive function, which should be interpreted as area under the curve, how can I say that that value is not infinite? If I keep going forever to the right, aren't I adding more and more area under that curve the further I go to the right? Well, remember, we're defining the value of this improper integral as a limit. So the question is, is the area under this curve starting at a and then going forever to the right limited by some amount? In other words, is there a ceiling to how much area there can be under that curve? Well, it turns out that if this function that you're finding the area under decreases quickly enough, then it turns out the area under that curve is limited. There, there is a ceiling to how much area you can get under there. Now, for that to happen, as you'll see shortly here, this function really does have to decrease quickly enough. Notice in our integrand here, and we might be able to, to make a little bit of a, a common sense guess here. Notice in this integrand, I'm multiplying x, which is an increasing function, by e to the minus x, which is a decreasing function. Okay, this is very loose statement, but it would be fair to say that e to the minus x in the long run is decreasing at a much faster rate than x is increasing. But the question is, what happens when I put these two together? That is, when I multiply this growing function by this decreasing function and then try to find the area under the curve that's the product of those two. Well, that's what we'll figure out here when we evaluate this. Uh, first of all, let's make sure we know how to set it up. So again, the interval of integration is 0 to infinity. Our function x e to the minus x is continuous on that interval. So I know the only thing I need to do is replace that infinity with something like a b and then take the limit of that definite integral as b goes to positive infinity. And I'm going to integrate x e to the minus x dx, which of course I know is an integration by parts problem. I would let u equal x and v prime equal e to the minus x, which means u prime equals 1 and v equals minus e to the minus x. So when you write one of these out, uh, don't drop the limit. Continue writing that because you haven't taken the limit yet. What I'm going to do inside that limit, though, is carry out the integration by parts. First, I know there would be a uv, which would be a minus x e to the minus x. And since that's part of my antiderivative, I would need to evaluate that from 0 to b. So let's write that that way. Minus, and now I'm taking the, the integral in the last part of the integration by parts formula, it would be minus integral v u prime dx, which would be minus 1 times e to the minus x. That, of course, is going to turn this into a plus, and I'm going to have the integral of e to the minus x still evaluated from 0 to b. So part of the reason for this example is to point out to you how I would write out this limit when I'm doing an integration by parts. This first part of the integration by parts, the uv part, I'm going to make sure that I write something that tells myself I'm evaluating that from 0 to b. The second part of the integration by parts, which is that little integral, that still has those same 0 to b limits included. Okay, now we continue. Limit b goes to infinity. 
I could go ahead and evaluate this part now if I want to. That is by plugging in the b and the 0. So when I plug in b, it'll be minus b e to the minus b minus whatever I get when I plug in 0, which is 0, plus the integral of e to the minus x, which is minus e to the minus x, which will be evaluated from 0 to b. Obviously, we can combine a few of these steps into one line. I'm being a little more deliberate here this first time and writing out each little piece. So when I go to the next line, I think we can dump that 0. And then I simply need to evaluate e to the negative x, negative e to the negative x, from 0 to b. So when I plug in b, I'm going to get minus e to the minus b. When I plug in 0, I'm going to get plus 1. All right, now, it should be easy enough to see that as b goes to infinity, this term will go to 0. The question is, what happens to this part? So question, what's the limit as b goes to infinity of negative b e to the minus b? And that's not a trivial question, although you, you should know the answer. It's the question or the issue I was raising up here originally, which is one of these is growing and one of these is decreasing. And so what's, what's the blend of those two going to do? And now we're down to it. What is the limit as b goes to infinity of the product of these two? Now, of course, as b goes to infinity, this part goes to infinity, but e to the minus b goes to zero. I recognize that that's an infinity times zero indeterminate form, which means if I want to apply L'Hopital's rule, this is the situation where we said we should reciprocate one of the two factors to make it either an infinity over infinity form or a zero over zero form. Um, the easier one actually to reciprocate is the e to the minus b, because I can just move it to the bottom and make it e to the b. Notice now that this is going to infinity, and e to the b is also going to infinity, which means now I could apply L'Hopital's rule. The derivative of the top would be minus 1. The derivative of the bottom would be e to the b, and that limit's obviously 0. Okay, meaning the e to the b function in the bottom is definitely the stronger function, the faster growing function. So when I make it negative b times e to the minus b, this e to the minus b is pulling this product to zero much faster than the b is trying to make the product increase. Okay, that means this part is also zero. That means the value of our original integral is one. So the integral zero to infinity x e to the minus x is 1. Okay, so to summarize, what we've got so far are integrals of this form that are improper because of the positive infinity. We've got integrals of this form that are improper because of the negative infinity. So let's consider a third type now which combines these two let's say we have infinities on both limits. So in other words, our domain of integration, our interval of integration, is the entire number line. All right, now the definition we'd like is one that would allow us to cut that interval from negative infinity to infinity at any point we like. So let's say a C. In other words, I'm taking the number line and I'm splitting it at a point C and partitioning the real number line into two parts, negative infinity up to C and then C to infinity. And the definition we arrive at uh, should work regardless of where that cut point is. So 
the natural cut point you might have in mind is zero, but the definition we come up with should work even if the cut point was 5900. That is, if I write this as negative infinity to zero plus zero to infinity, and let's say these two limits exist, then I should get the same answer if I split it at 5900. Okay, because these two finite numbers, if they exist, would add up to, let's say, f is a positive function, just so we have a concrete picture. If these two limits exist, those would be areas under curves, and they should add up to the area under the entire curve over the entire domain, negative infinity to infinity. That should still be true in this case over here. Just because I've split it into two different pieces, the sum of those two areas should still add up to the total area under the curve over that negative infinity to infinity domain. All right, so our definition is going to be the integral negative infinity to infinity f of x dx will be precisely the limit as, let's say, a goes to negative infinity of, say, a to c plus the limit as, say, b, notice this is a different letter, and there's a reason for that, of the integral c to b f of x dx. And of course, c then is that number where I am splitting the number line. So here's negative infinity, here's positive infinity. I'm splitting at c, and so this first integral is obviously negative infinity to c, except I'm simulating the negative infinity with a limit of a going to negative infinity with that lower limit being an a. The other interval, the c to infinity, that's this second integral, and that's an integral c to b where I'm simulating the positive infinity by taking a limit as b goes to positive infinity and there should be a positive infinity right there. Okay, that's our setup. If either of these two integrals diverges, so I mean if either this integral, which is basically negative infinity to c f of x dx, or this other integral, which is basically the integral c to infinity f of x dx, if either of those two diverge, then the entire integral negative infinity to infinity f of x dx diverges. Okay, let's look at an example, and we'll pick something really simple here to see what's happening. So let's do integral negative infinity to infinity. Let's just do x, x dx. So by our definition, we would say this is the limit as a goes to negative infinity, the integral a to... Now, we can cut the number line anywhere we want, and zero is often a convenient choice. And our definition shouldn't make a difference when we apply this, so we're, we're going to pick an easy cut point of zero. Plus the integral, okay, what's the other one? It's going to start at zero and go to positive infinity. So I need to take the limit as b goes to positive infinity, where I've replaced that upper limit by a b. Okay, and as I said, make sure that when you're doing one of these negative infinity to infinity inter integrals and you split it up into these two limits, make sure these two variables that you're using are different. And I'll show you in a minute why that's important. Okay, there's our setup. So, of course, if I write this out, that would be limit as A approaches negative infinity 
of x squared over 2 evaluated from a to 0 plus the limit b goes to positive infinity also of x squared over 2 but evaluated from 0 to b. That would be limit a approaches negative infinity of 0 squared over 2 minus a squared over 2. So that's what I get when I evaluate this one. Plus limit as b goes to infinity of b squared over 2 minus 0. Okay, as a approaches negative infinity, it's pretty clear that this limit does not exist. And it's clear that this limit also does not exist. Okay, and in our definition, we said if either one of these two limits doesn't exist, then the entire integral is divergent. Okay, in this case, they both don't exist. So I'm going to say the integral negative infinity to infinity x dx is divergent. Okay, let's consider a related integral. Let, let's do the same one, except this time, instead of replacing the negative infinity by an a and the positive infinity by a b, let's replace them both by the same thing, that is the same letter, but we'll call this one a negative a and we'll call this one an a, and we'll take the limit as a approaches infinity and our function was x. So think about what that looks like versus our other version which was limit a approaches negative infinity of a to 0 plus limit as b approaches infinity of 0 to b. Okay this one over here this one we're talking about now I could also split that at 0 so that I had limit as a approaches infinity of let's say negative a to 0 x dx plus integral 0 to a x dx. Okay what's this one going to give us? It gives us limit as a approaches infinity of of course x squared over 2 evaluated from negative a to 0 plus x squared over 2 evaluated from 0 to a. Uh, what do I get when I evaluate inside? Uh, I still get a minus a squared over 2 from this first part and in the second part I get plus a squared over 2 which means I get the limit as a approaches infinity of 0 which is 0. Okay, and if you think about what the graph looks like, it should make sense to you what's happening. This is the graph of y equals x. And if I take the integral from negative a to a, then of course I'm starting and stopping at points that are equidistant from zero. Which means if I did a finite definite integral like this one, I would of course have two areas that were equal but opposite in sign when counted in the Riemann sum which means when I add those two up I would get zero. Okay which means if I take the limit as a approaches infinity it's not going to matter what a is the limit is always going to be zero. Okay the question is why is this not an appropriate definition for the integral negative infinity to infinity x dx? Well notice that there's two problems with that. Number one, the cut point that we chose of zero, uh, it doesn't have to be zero. Remember what we said earlier, whatever we define the value of this definite integral to be if it converges cannot be dependent on the cut point. And obviously in this picture with y equals x, the reason these two areas are canceling out when this is negative a and a 
is because of the symmetry about zero. Uh, what if my cut point was at, say, one, where all of this area plus this would be the left integral, and then all of this would be the rest. So in other words, we'd be going from negative a to one plus one to a. Then of course in that case we don't have the symmetry and these two areas, one positive, one negative, don't cancel each other out exactly. So in fact it skews a little bit towards the negative side. Similarly I could cut at a negative number. So there's one issue with this. Um, the other issue is that there's simply nothing in the formula negative infinity to infinity x dx let's say in this integral there's nothing that insists that we head let's say in both directions so by both directions I mean negative infinity and positive infinity at the same rate. Okay, what I mean by that is if this is y equals x and I'm integrating from negative infinity to infinity, there's nothing that says that I have to start at zero and go the same distance to the right as I do to the left. I may want to go way out here, but I may want to go this way slower in which case the two areas I get would be quite different. And there's simply nothing in that integral that says you're going in those two directions at the same speed. And that's really the reason for these two different variables, because I want those two things to be independent of each other. And so our definition does not rely on that cut point, and it doesn't rely proceeding from that cut point in both directions in exactly the same way. This definition we chose allows me to select any cut point and to move in both directions any way that I want to. If I can do that in a way such that both of those integrals exist, then my integral will be convergent. If not, if either one of them diverges, the entire integral diverges. Here's another quick example just to show you another peculiar thing that can happen. Let's look at 0 to infinity sine x dx. And if you stop and think about the graph for just a moment, I think you can probably guess what the answer to this is. If I start at 0 and I go to infinity, then of course what's going to happen when I calculate this, I'm going to add area, then take away area, then add area, then take away area, and so on. Since you're going to infinity, is there actually any fixed stopping point? Well, if there's not a stopping point, it means I can't ever really say that the limit of this integral is this area, or this area minus this area, or this area minus this area. Since there really is no stopping point, uh, our limit for this integral shouldn't really exist if I just think about what's happening in the picture. Okay, let's go ahead and evaluate, and we know our setup would be limit b goes to positive infinity, 0 to b sine x dx. And of course, what do I get for a limit? Limit is b goes to infinity of minus cosine x evaluated from 0 to b which is limit as b goes to infinity of minus cosine b plus cosine 0, which is 1. Now it would be great if that limit is 1, but we know that's simply not true, because what is the limit as b goes to infinity of minus cosine b? Well, that doesn't exist. The cosine function never gets close to any fixed y value and stays close to it. Alright, so consistent with what we thought was happening in the picture, 
this is another example of a divergent integral, but not because the limit of this antiderivative is infinity. So the purpose of this example is to show you that improper integrals can also diverge in this way. Our previous examples diverged because the limits were infinite. That is, the amounts of area under the curve were just getting larger and larger without bound. This is an example to show you that sometimes it's simply because the area accumulated under the curve doesn't really get close to any particular value and stay close to it. Okay, now, before we move on to the last part of the section, uh, let's consider one last example, sort of a famous one, a, a really simple one though. So let's look at integral 1 to infinity, 1 over x dx, and let's look at the integral 1 to infinity, 1 over x squared dx. Okay, quickly writing these out, we know this first one would be limit as b goes to infinity, integral 1 to b, 1 over x dx, which would be limit b goes to infinity, ln x evaluated from 1 to b, which would be limit b goes to infinity ln b, and I'll leave off the absolute value since b is positive, minus ln 1. ln 1 is 0, so this would be limit b goes to infinity ln b, uh, which we know is infinity. So this one definitely diverges. Okay, let's look at the other one. That would be limit as b goes to infinity integral 1 to b um, x to the minus 2 dx, which is limit b goes to infinity minus 1 over x, evaluated from 1 to b, which would be limit b goes to infinity negative 1 over b plus 1, and as b goes to infinity, we know that this part will go to 0, meaning our limit is 1. All right, so there's, there's two things I want to say about this example. Uh, number one is that if we think about 1 over x, and we think about y equals 1 over x squared, What's the difference between those two? Well, the big difference is that this one decreases more quickly, right? Once we pass 1, 1 over x squared is less than 1 over x. And so I know, of course, that if I were to graph 1 over x squared, the 1 over x squared graph will be below the graph of 1 over x, and it will get squeezed towards 0 a little faster than 1 over x does. Remember what I said earlier, the way that you get a limit on the amount of area under this positive curve is for that function to decrease quickly enough. Well, what this example shows you is that these two functions, which are pretty similar actually, uh, behave very differently when you try to calculate the area under the curve from 1 to infinity. The area under this curve from 1 to infinity is unlimited there is no bound to it. The area under this curve from 1 to infinity is bounded. It is limited by 1. In other words, when I find the area under the 1 over x squared, or under the 1 over x squared curve, from 1 to any point on the way to positive infinity, it will never exceed 1. The further I go to the right, the closer this area under the curve will try and reach the limit of 1. It'll be increasing to it, in fact. Um, one other interesting thing before we move on that uh, you might notice, we're definitely saying that the area under the 1 over x curve is unbounded, but of course if I think about the integral 1 over x squared, if I took the integral of pi times 1 to infinity 1 over x squared dx, you understand that that would be the volume of the solid of revolution that would result 
if I revolve the curve 1 over x about the x-axis. And notice what our integral on the right here says is that that volume is actually bounded and finite. Actually, it would be pi times 1. It would be pi. Meaning, you have a curve such that the area under that curve from 1 to infinity is unbounded. Okay, of course, that would be measured in square units of area. But for that same curve, when I form the solid of revolution, the volume of that solid is not unbounded. It is actually bounded by pi, meaning the further I go this way, the closer the volume of this funnel gets to the number pi. I think the big takeaway from this, aside from the interesting visual here with the, the funnel and the area under 1 over x, is this point about the difference in the convergence behavior. When I just put a 2 on that x, it made that function decay quickly enough that the integral became a convergent integral. So we're going to come back to this, the difference between 1 over x and 1 over x squared. But for right now, just keep in mind that the integral 1 to infinity 1 over x diverges, but the integral 1 to infinity 1 over x squared converges. Okay, now let's talk about the other type of improper integral. So the, let's say the other type of improper integral. Well, what's the other thing that could go wrong with an integral or could be a little pathological? Our first type was infinite interval of integration. The other type is where we have, let's say, a finite interval, finite in length, but our function is discontinuous at some point. And the discontinuity is non-removable. Okay, what I mean by that specifically is, uh, let's say case one, if f of x is, let's say, continuous on the interval a to b, open at a and close at b, and the limit as x approaches a from the right of f of x is plus or minus infinity. So if you notice what I'm saying there, I'm saying that we're continuous on the interval open at a, close at b, and as I approach a from the right, I have an infinite discontinuity at A, and that's what I meant when I said non-removable. So in other words, there is a vertical asymptote at A. So if the function is continuous on that half open interval, and at the open end there is a discontinuity that's infinite, then we'll define the integral A to B f of x dx to be equal to the limit as let's say t approaches a from the right of the integral t to b f of x dx if this limit exists. And if you compare this to what we were doing with the earlier cases with the infinite intervals of integration, it should make sense what I'm doing here. I am simply replacing the thing that was causing the problem, which is the discontinuity, that's the A. I'm replacing that by an auxiliary variable, say a T, and then I'm letting T approach A from the right. And make sure that you do it from the right direction. If I'm integrating from A to B, and the problem I have is a discontinuity day that I'm going to be approaching A from the right. Similarly, if F is continuous 
on, let's say, A to B that is closed at the left endpoint, open at the right, and the limit as X approaches B from the left of our function is infinite. In other words, I have a non-removable discontinuity at B from the left. Then we'll say the integral from A to B f of x dx equals the limit as t approaches B from the left of the integral A to t f of x dx. And again, same thing. If the problem is at B, when I integrate from A to B, and there's an infinite or non-removable discontinuity at B, then I'm going to approach B from the left and just replace that B by a T and let T go to B from the left. And that will be the value of this improper integral, again, if this limit exists. Okay, obviously, just as before, if these limits don't exist, we again say the integral diverge. Okay, let's look at a couple of examples. Uh, let's start with this one. 0 to 2 dx over x minus 1 squared. Okay, for this one, I'm going to roll a couple of things into this one example. First of all, these are the two questions you should now ask yourself when you see something you think might be an improper integral. Is the interval of integration infinite in length? Of course, it's not here. It's just 0 to 2. What's the other question? Are there any infinite discontinuities in that interval? And of course there is one at x equals 1. I know that as I approach 1 from either the right or the left, the limit as x approaches 1 of 1 over x minus 1 squared is positive infinity from the left and from the right. All right, so this has the obvious discontinuity problem. Okay, but I've thrown you a little curve here. In the examples and formulas I just showed you, I put the discontinuity at the end of the interval. Notice here it's in the middle. 0 to 2 is our interval. x equals 1 is where the problem is. Okay, intuitively here, what should you do to handle this? Well, it would make sense, I think, to do the same trick we used in the previous cases split this into two intervals because if this integral really does exist I should be able to split it at any cut point I want. That's true of any definite integral. So I'm going to split it at 1 and make an integral that goes from 0 to 1 and one that goes from 0 to 2. And that's obviously the convenient choice since I'm splitting it at the discontinuity point I can just evaluate each of these improper integrals separately now. So for this first one, since the problem is at 1, I would want to do a limit, let's say, as a approaches 1 from the, now let's make sure we're coming from the right direction. If this is 0 and this is 1, and I know the problem's at 1, I need to approach from the left. Okay, for the other one, of course, same situation. Now it's 1 as the left endpoint, which means I'm going to need to approach 1 from the left. So this should be limit as, let's say, B approaches, I'm sorry, from the right. So as B approaches 1 from the right of B to 2. Okay, again, same thing we talked about earlier. I need two different auxiliary variables here. 
I need an a for this first integral and something else for this other integral because these really are now two independent integrals. Now if either one of these diverges, this entire integral diverges. Uh, so actually there's a built-in shortcut there if you notice. If I really am splitting one of these into two integrals and I evaluate the first one and the first one diverges, it would be just sufficient to stop at that point because I know the entire integral diverges. In other words, if I'm checking these two and I determine that this first one diverges, I don't really need to check the second one. It won't matter what the second one does. If this is an infinity, and let's say this one converges and is 1, well, infinity plus 1 is still infinity, and it still diverges. All right, so let's go ahead and grab that first one. Write out what it is. Its limit a approaches 1 from the left. Um, again, that's the integral of x minus 1 to the negative 2, which means I should get negative x minus 1 to the minus 1, which would be negative 1 over x minus 1, evaluated from 0 to a, which would be limit a approaches 1 from the left of negative 1 over a minus 1 plus 1 over 0 minus 1 will actually be minus 1. Okay, as a approaches 1 from the left, what does this function do? Well, as a approaches 1 from the left, the limit of what I have in green is negative infinity. But of course, there's a negative outside that, so actually the limit of this part is positive infinity. Well, that means the whole thing diverges. It's actually infinite. Um, I'll let you check the other one. But as I said, at this point, it doesn't really matter. This first one diverges. And based on what we said before, since I should be able to cut this integral from 0 to 2 at any point that I want, and obviously it made sense to cut it at the discontinuity point, one of those two integrals diverges. The entire integral diverges. Okay, let's try another one. Uh, this time let's just do a simple 0 to 1 variety. Let's say x ln x dx. So of course when you see that you know that I'm going to throw an integration by parts problem in here now. But again, it's not the interval of integration that's infinite. There's a discontinuity. Where's the discontinuity? It's at 0. I know there's a vertical asymptote for the ln function at 0. So I'm going to have to make this the limit as, let's say, b goes to 0 from the right of the integral b to 1 x ln x dx. OK, when you're writing this out, be careful to copy that limit down each time until you finally take the limit. So I'm not doing the limit yet because I haven't actually integrated yet. I definitely have to do this part first before I can take the limit. Make sure you understand that. Remember that the definite integral itself is actually a limit. It's the limit of a Riemann sum. So in a sense, this is actually the limit of a limit. And those two limits are not interchangeable. Sometimes they are, but they're only under very specific conditions. So when you're evaluating an improper integral like this, you definitely have to do the integration first before you take that limit. The limit always comes last. Okay, in this case, let's see, we've got integration by parts. I guess we want to let v prime equal x and u equal ln of x, which means u prime equals 1 over x and v equals x squared over 2. That would be the standard way. So of course when I integrate part parts I'm going to get uv, so I'm going to get x squared ln x over 2. Remember that's evaluated from b to 1 minus the integral from b to 1 
of v u prime. And of course, u prime is 1 over x. So when I take v u prime, I get x squared over 2 times 1 over x. So I get x over 2. So putting that together, I get limit b approaches 0 from the right of, let's go ahead and evaluate this part. That would be 1 times ln of 1 over 2, which is 0, minus b squared ln b over 2, minus x squared over 4, evaluated from b to 1. So I guess we're going to have the limit of minus b squared ln b over 2 minus 1 quarter plus b squared over 4. And again, the easy one to spot is this one. The limit is b goes to 0 of that part 0, which means the only question then is this part. That is, what's the limit? as b goes to 0 from the right of negative b squared ln b over 2, which, let me just pull out that negative 1 half so that we understand the limit we're really talking about is b squared ln b. All right, we've already seen this in a previous example. Previous example. Sometimes when you evaluate these, in the course of taking your limit, you may have to actually apply L'Hopital's rule. So again, as b approaches 0 from the right, I know this part approaches 0. But of course, I know the log function as I approach 0 from the right approaches negative infinity. This is a 0 times negative infinity form. And again, we know the trick for that. It's always to reciprocate one of the two functions so that I can apply L'Hopital's rule. So I'll do it this way. I'll say that limit b approaches 0 from the right of b squared ln b. Let's just make that limit b approaches 0 from the right of ln b over b to the minus 2, which would be 1 over b squared. And notice this is definitely a form we can apply L'Hopital's rule to now. This is negative infinity. The limit of the bottom is positive infinity. I don't care about the sign difference. When I see infinity over infinity, I know I can apply L'Hopital's. So this would be limit as b approaches 0 from the right, derivative of the top, 1 over b, derivative of the bottom, negative 2 over b cubed. That would be limit as b approaches 0 from the right of negative b squared over 2, which is clearly 0. Okay, what that tells me then is the limit of that part is also 0. Therefore, what is this entire limit? It's negative 1 quarter. Therefore, the integral 0 to 1 x ln x is actually equal to negative 1 quarter. And again, it's back to this same issue. As x approaches 0, this one is approaching 0. This one approaches negative infinity. When I multiply those, it's unclear what that product is at any individual x value close to 0. Uh, that's why we call this indeterminate. Then what's the area over that entire interval 0 to 1? Well, it ends up there's a strange mix when you put these two functions together. The area is actually negative 1 quarter, meaning the negative function is dominating, but not dominating in the sense that this area from 0 to 1 was negative infinity. It's actually a finite value. Okay, I want to look at one last example now that's uh, sort of a famous and important one. So I want to look at the integral 0 to 1, 1 over x to the p dx, where p is a positive value. Uh, let's call this 
a p integral. So I'll put p in quotes. And really what we're, what we're going to ask here generically is how does this improper integral behave for different values of p? And we've already talked about this a little bit with some specific examples, but now we're going to try and figure out in general for what values of p can I say for what values of p this integral converges or this integral diverges? Okay, so let's just go ahead and do it. Again, of course, it's improper because of the lower limit. If p is positive, then I know 1 over x to p has an infinite discontinuity at x equals 0. So I'm going to replace that 0 by some variable, let's say b. I'm going to take the limit as b or as, sorry, as b approaches 0 from the right of 1 over x to the p dx. All right, now, uh, before I start writing limits, think about what's going to happen when you integrate 1 over x to the p. And if you think about it for a minute, you'll realize there are two different possibilities. If I'm integrating 1 over x to the p, which is actually x to the minus p, then if I was applying the power rule to that, I would get x to the minus p plus 1 over minus p plus 1. Which means to evaluate this, I would have to take the limit as b approaches 0 from the right of x to the minus p plus 1 over minus p plus 1 evaluated from 1 to b. Now, when would this power rule apply to this integration? Only if p was not 1. Notice that if p is 1, you're just integrating 1 over x. And in that case, you know the antiderivative is just ln of x. Okay, so just because of that one special case when p is 1, I'm going to write it this way just to show that there are two different possibilities for my antiderivative. Okay, let's take the, the simple one, this uh, last one right here. And of course for that one, I can see that if I take the limit as b approaches 0 of the ln of b minus the ln of 1, well, again, ln of 1 is 0, and I know what the log function does as x approaches 0 from the right. It goes to negative infinity. So this is actually negative infinity, which means if p is 1, then obviously the integral 0 to 1, 1 over x to the p dx diverges. So in that special case, let's just say here in red, if I can get my colors sorted out, that this one diverges. And let me clean up some of this so we can do the other part. Okay, so that leaves the question mark, what about the other one? And so for that one, we do the same thing. We look at the limit b approaches 0 from the right of, okay, let's go ahead and plug in b. It would be b to the minus p plus 1 over negative p plus 1 minus what I get when I plug in 1 for x. Well, that would be 1 to the minus p plus 1 over minus p plus 1. So I think we've got limit b approaches 0 from the right of, let me call that b to the 1 minus p over 1 minus p minus, well, what's 1 to the minus p plus 1 provided p is greater than 0? Well, it's just going to be 1. So this part would be 1 over 1 minus p. Now realize that for a fixed p value, this number is just a constant. So if this limit exists, uh, one of the terms in the answer is just going to be this 
minus 1 over 1 minus p. So the real question is, uh, what is this limit right here? So question mark, what is the limit as b approaches 0 from the right of b to the 1 minus p over 1 minus p? Well, note, if p is less than 1, then 1 minus p is positive. So what happens when you have b to a positive exponent over a constant, and you ask what the limit is as b approaches 0? Well, if b is re being raised to a positive exponent and b approaches 0, then this approaches 0. And then 0 over a non-zero constant would be 0. So if p is less than 1, that exponent is positive, and this limit that we're talking about would be 0. OK, what happens if p is bigger than 1? Well, then 1 minus p is negative. And if 1 minus p is negative, that means what we're really looking at with this limit is limit b approaches 0 from the right of, let's say, 1 over 1 minus p times b to a positive exponent. What I mean by that is if 1 minus p is negative, then when you move that to the bottom, it becomes b to the p minus 1, which would be b raised to a positive exponent. And in that case, I know that this limit is definitely an infinity. All right, that means there are two cases here. It really depends on whether this p value is less than 1 or whether it's greater than 1. If p is less than 1, then we said the limit of this thing in yellow is 0. If p is greater than 1, then we're saying the limit of this thing up here in yellow is infinite. Okay, therefore, if we put all that together, we can say the following. 1, we said in the beginning if p equals 1, then the integral 0 to 1, 1 over x to the p dx diverges. Number 2, if p is less than 1, then we said this integral converges. Okay, why? Because the limit of this part will be 0, which means the answer would just be minus 1 over 1 minus p, which is an actual value. Okay, what's the other case? The other case is if p is bigger than 1, we concluded that this improper integral diverges. Okay, again, because if p is bigger than 1, this integral, or this function, when I take the limit as b approaches 0, is infinite, does not exist. Okay, putting this all together, we can say what? The integral 0 to 1, 1 over x to the p dx, converges if and only if what? p is less than 1. It diverges if and only if p is greater than 1 or equal to 1. So to sum up, we're saying this p integral, integral 0 to 1, 1 over x to the p, will converge only if that p value is less than 1. If it's greater than or equal to 1 for that power on that x and that denominator, automatically diverges. And now that we've proven this here, you can use these as facts. And we'll be using this in a few other places as we move through the next chapter. So this is a fact we can file away now. This so-called p integral will converge if that p is greater than 0 but less than 1. It will diverge if p is greater than or equal to 1. Okay, the other p integral I'll mention here just before we close is the one that goes from, let's say, 1 to infinity 
1 over x minus 1 to the p. Okay, this is the other p-series that I would reference when I'm talking about p-series. Okay, do you see what the problem is with this one? Well, this one actually has two problems. It obviously has the infinite interval of integration, but it's also got a discontinuity, an infinite discontinuity at x equals 1. So I'm going to leave this one for you to prove yourself, but I would like you to try and show that this one converges if and only if p is greater than 1. And this is also, again, for p greater than 0 powers. And this diverges if and only if p is greater than 0 but less than or equal to 1. So if you notice, that's the exact opposite of what we just talked about with this one. This one converged if p was less than 1, and it diverged if p was greater than or equal to 1. Notice this one's the opposite. This one is saying that the integral converges if p is greater than 1, in other words, if it's a larger power, but it diverges if it's a smaller power. And you should try to prove this yourself and proceed the same way we just did in the last one. Uh, just realize that you would have to split this somewhere. So I'm going to let you do this yourself, but I'll just note for you that if you're going to do 1 to infinity, 1 over x minus 1 to the p dx, since it has an infinite interval of integration and a discontinuity at the left endpoint, I really should try and split this up into two parts. One that goes, let's say, from 1 to a cut number of your choice, let's say 2. Plus that cut number to infinity. And I'll just point out one more thing to you before I let you go. Notice that for notice that for this integral to exist or converge, both of these integrals have to converge. So your job would be to figure out what p values will make both of these two integrals converge. It's not enough for just one of the two to converge, but let's say the other one diverges. In that case, this one diverges. So the question is, what p-values make both of these two on the right converge? And what I'm telling you up here is that both of these will converge if and only if p is greater than 1. So give that a try. And once we have that down, then we have our second type of p-series, which is the one that has an infinite interval of integration and a discontinuity at the left endpoint. Okay, good place to stop. Let me know if you have questions.